If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to John chapter 17. I'm going to move away from Galatians just for this week and next, since next week's Father's Day. But I want to talk about the subject matter for our Vacation Bible School this week. The idea of knowing God. Isn't it amazing? That we have the capacity to know God. He has called us to know Him. You want to talk about a mystery? The fact that God even considers us worthy, first of all, of the gift of His Son. But He could have done that and still remain distant. But no, he wants fellowship with us. That is an amazing thought that the God of the universe, the one true and living God, the creator of the universe, wants to have a relationship with you and I. He wants you to know the real him. He already knows the real you. Hello? John 17, one verse this morning. Verse 3. And this is eternal life. This is Jesus praying to the Father that they may know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Father, Speak to us this morning about knowing you. Lord, my prayer is that each person here knows you. Father, change us today. Convict us. Conform us to the image of your Son. Father, but reveal to us, Lord, the true nature of our relationship with you today. Father, may it be one of reality. May it become one of depth. Lord, call us to yourself today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've entitled the sermon this morning, They May Know You. Knowing the only true God is a life-changing experience. Knowing Did you hear me? The only true God is a life-changing experience. Some of you are wondering why Kevin is so far behind on the slides this morning. There are no slides this morning. I wasn't sure what kind of structure we'd have up here, so I just went without the PowerPoint. That means you have to listen. Sorry. I want to talk to you just about three simple things about the idea of knowing God this morning. First, I've already kind of referenced it, but there's the potential to know Him. Jesus says that they may know you. There is, a, there is potential of knowing God in a real and true way. That's what we're going to talk to the kids about this week. The idea of knowing who God is. God is personal. Did you know that? God doesn't save nations. God doesn't save people groups. God saves individuals. And he enters into a relationship on that same basis, a personal one-on-one relationship, which still blows my mind that God would take even a second of his time to have a relationship with me. God is personal. We see it in his personality. You know, some would say, the naysayers of our faith would say, you can't know some cosmic spiritual being. There's no way to know God. But we see his personality in the scripture. Genesis 6-6 says that he repents and grieves. 
1 Kings 11.9 talks, talks about the fact of his anger. Deuteronomy 6.15 says that he is a jealous God. Revelation 3.19 and many other places in Scripture talks about the way he loves. And Proverbs 6.16 references the fact that he hates. I want you to know this morning God is a personal God. He is a personal God. And if we're going to be changed by him, we must know him in a personal way. Not, not in a religious way. In a personal way. Sometimes I believe we sit in the church and we know God the same way we know an actor because we see their work and we go, oh, I know who that is, and we can immediately hear their voice and say oh I know who that is and and we see their face and we recognize we see all these things but we have no relationship with that person whatsoever we know a lot of things but we don't know them see I'm not sitting here this morning and going to talk to you about how many facts do you know about God I want to know do you know him on a personal and real level. God is personal. We see it in his names. Genesis 22 in the Hebrew introduces us to Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you know God is your provider? You might get a check with some other name on it from your employment. But I wonder, but I wonder every week, do you thank Jehovah Jireh for your provision? Not XYZ Company, not Mr. So and so, not Mrs. So and so, not anybody else. Listen, if we truly know God in a personal way, we understand that He is Jehovah Jireh, He is our provider. It's not a party, a political party. It's not anybody who's in office. It is the one true living God. In Exodus 15, we're introduced to Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Do you know him this morning? Do you know him this morning? Psalm 23, you know it very well, Jehovah Rapha. The Lord, our shepherd. I preach that passage numerous times about what it means to be shepherded by Christ. His care and his provision and his presence. Do you recognize him this morning in that way? Oh, I know Psalm 23, preacher. But do you know the one Psalm 23 speaks of? Is he real in your life today? Ezekiel 48, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. The Lord is present. One of the things that's necessary for a relationship is presence. He's present with you always. Are you walking with him? God has called you to a personal relationship. We must understand that he invites us to know him personally. You've been invited personally. That should mean something to you this morning. It's not just some random flyer in the mail. It was a personal invitation offered to you by the Spirit of God to come know Him personally. Do we understand today that God is a personal God? Yes, He's he's over all. But what does it mean to know Him personally? What does it change for us in the way we live our lives 
I want to tell you the first thing it will change is you'll come to know that when you study his word, it's not just a collection of stories. You're studying a person. Every, every bit of scripture that God gives us in his word is not so that we might learn some parable. It's that we might know him better. Every bit of it, every precept, every law, every concept, every doctrine, every story is not so I can memorize verses, but I can get to know the one who wrote them to me. His love letter. It's personal. So when I read the Bible, it changes if I know I'm receiving it from somebody I have a personal relationship with. By understanding that God has invited me to a personal relationship, it means that I direct my faith towards a person and not a religion. That's what we've been talking about in Galatians. I want to tell you something, church. Your faith is not in Republican Baptist Church. Your faith is not in a preacher. Your faith is not in a baptismal pool or a prayer or a role. Your faith is directed toward the one person that can save, and that is Jesus the Christ. That's personal. When I was teaching in Africa, we got on the subject of eternal security. <clears throat> and a man asked me some while later, he said, Teacher, would you tell me if, I've never seen a, a group of people, I said this the other day, a group of people that wanted to get lost again so bad. What if... They came up with all these scenarios that, that they wanted me to answer. What if I'm under church discipline? Will I still go to heaven? I said, brother, let me tell you, the church has nothing to do with your salvation. Nothing. Nothing. You can be every committee that's ever been formed in a Southern Baptist church, you could be the chairman of all of them. It still matters nothing about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that the church and our relationship with the Lord are contrary to one another. My point is this. Our faith is not in any organization or any de denomination. It is toward one person, and that's Jesus Christ. I can't have a relationship with the Baptist church. I can have a relationship with this body. But you want me to tell you how fickle the Baptists are? Go down the road a few miles to the next one, and you'll sit in there and go, this ain't nothing like the last one. And then go a few more miles to the next one. This ain't nothing like the next one. I blew their mind in Africa. We got to talk about denominations. I said, you, you want me to tell you where denominations came from? Pride. Pride. And I said, even amongst Baptists, we can't agree. There's almost 70 different Baptist denominations. So our relationship is not Baptist. Our relationship is not this thing or that thing. Our relationship is with Jesus Christ. Now, through him, we can have a relationship as a body. That's a beautiful thing. But even us, our head is Christ. So when we direct our fate towards something, it's not a thing, it's a person. Thirdly, when we sin, we realize we sin against a person and not a set of rules. That makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. I've told you before, when I was growing up, my dad went to church, but he was not much of a spiritual leader. But one of the things I never wanted to do, and I know some of y'all think that I was a really, really, really good kid. <laughs> it 
It's true, Elvin. <laughs> and in comparison to my siblings, I probably was. But regardless of what the rules were or what I was up to, you know the one thing I never, ever, ever want to do, and this is before the Lord even saved me, I never wanted to hurt two people, and that is my mother and my grandmother. Never wanted them to hear a bad report about me. You see, because my relationship with them and what they meant to me mattered more than rules or what I was doing. When we understand that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when we sin, we don't just think, oh my goodness, I blew it on uh, you know, commandment number seven. No, what we realize immediately is that we have grieved the heart of the one who hung on the cross for us. I am a friend of God. And I have broken his heart with my sin. It makes a difference in your life when you realize you're sinning against a person and not just precepts or a set of rules. We're saved by a person and not a performance. You see, the reason we aren't grateful, church, the reason why we can sing hymns and look like we're having an appendectomy <laughs> is because we don't realize that Christ did what he did for me personally and you personally. If somebody rescued you from a fire or did CPR and saved your life, I guarantee you the next time you had an opportunity to meet them, you wouldn't be like, thank you, appreciate it. Y'all know I get on to you about your countenance. But I guarantee you would not go, appreciate what you did. Let me give you $2 in the plate. Thank you. Preacher, are you mocking us? Maybe a little bit. But I'm mocking me too. Because if we really understood that it is a personal thing that Jesus Christ did for me explicitly. You see, that's what you need to understand. You were saved by a person with you on his mind. And so when I get to sing of his love, I ought to do so with enthusiasm. When I get to come to, I get to come to Sunday school to learn more about him, it should be with enthusiasm. I was not saved by any entity. I was saved by the person of Jesus Christ. It changes how we view everything we do when we realize it's a personal relationship. So there's the potential to know him. But secondly, there's the parameters that we must know him in. We must know him as he is, and that is spirit. If we're going to know God, it has to be a spiritual thing. You see, where so many people get hung up is they know him here as an intellectual thing. But they never get to the place where it's a spiritual thing. Isaiah 43, 10, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, <clears throat> and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. There was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. We need to understand that he is the preexistent self-existent God and he's not just a fact to be obtained God's not a concept to be grasped he's a person to be known 
what's holding us back, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, there's a, a testimony about Christ about God that we can't get in the, in the physical. We have to get it in the spiritual. And that's what we're going to attempt to teach the children this week. Not all of these. I'm going to go through them rather quickly. But I want you to hear some of the attributes of God that your children will be exposed to this week. Number one, God is righteous and just. You can read about that in Romans 2. In other words, God's always fair. Now... You say that's a good thing unless you ain't right with him. He's still going to be fair. God is righteous and fair. Here's what amazes me about God is he deals with every one of us fairly. Doesn't mean he deals with all of us equally. But he deals with all of us fairly. You get the difference? You see, Paul saying his way out of jail, you might not be able to do that. Bubba, you probably could. <laughs> Let that man out. He is in torture. God is absolute truth. We just saw that in our verse 17.3. The one true God. He is absolute truth. What's so beautiful about that is... We can come to him and always know where we stand before him. Isn't that good? I've asked you this before. Are you one of those friends that tells their, your friend they've got lettuce in their teeth? Or you just wait and let them go away and, and realize later they had lettuce in it? Man, I've, how long has that been there? You see, we struggle with what to tell people and what not. I don't want to hurt their feelings. Listen. Here's what I love about God. He doesn't care about your feelings. He holds the mirror of his righteous word up and says, Listen, my friend, you need to see some things. But here's the beautiful part. He says, to here, I want you to see me at the same time. And here's what I offer. God is absolute truth. He is righteous and just God is holy. We like to think of holiness as a lack of sin or purity. And, and certainly it means that. But here's what it means also. That God is completely unique in every characteristic that's his. There's nobody like him. No one. He's holy. God is sovereign as to his control. God is completely in control. Do you believe that, church? You didn't believe it last election cycle. <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we going to do? <laughs> if so-and-so wins, we'll never make it. Is God still in control or not? Do you doubt him? That little thing in your heart, in your chest, rather, that's doing that? Is doing it because he's sovereignly in control. Amen? Amen? And when it stops doing that, it'll be because he said, stop doing that. God is sovereign. God is ever present. He's everywhere all the time. There's nowhere you can run from him, nowhere you can hide. Some of you are trying to hide this morning from the reality of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Isn't it good that God loves us so much that he never leaves us nor forsakes us? I pray if you're struggling with your salvation that he'll hound you even more this week. God is all-knowing. Not one detail of one matter of one minute thing that goes on in the universe is happening without the knowledge of God. Now consider that for just a moment. Now look left and look right. 
and tell me what the person on your left and right is thinking right now. You don't even want to start, do you? It's a scary thought, isn't it? Most of them's thinking, I wish he would shut up and hush, so that you got a 50-50 chance to get that right. Now imagine this, every mind, everything that's happening in the world today, God knows every thought that's being thought at this very moment. He knows every detail of your life. I'm getting to the good news. And he loves you anyway. Knows every vile thing you've ever thought, every word you've ever muttered, even when you're alone, everything that you've done when you're alone, every ugly thing about your life, every prideful statement, every hateful statement, everything you have ever done, and he still loves you. God is all knowing, God is all merciful. Whew. all merciful it means he withholds what we deserve aren't you glad of that not one of us would be seated, seated here today or standing here this morning if God were not merciful God is faithful and immutable He's faithful and immutable. That word immutable means unchanging. Aren't you glad? Ooh, if you're in a relationship today, you deal with people who are not immutable. Hello? You wake up and look at the face and go, what am I dealing with today? Ooh, it's that personality. See you, honey. Have a great day. Isn't it beautiful? The, words, the word says this. He is same yesterday, today, and forever. Every morning, right? Every morning when we wake up and look at the face of our Father, we see the same face. Never changing. He's faithful and immutable. God is love. God is love, and sometimes we, we take that the wrong way. God's love, there's no, no consequences. God's not going to allow anything bad to happen. Listen, God is love, but don't forget he's also fair. God is righteous. God is holy. Don't let love set the, set the scales in the wrong place for you. Yes, God is love, but he's also all those other things. And God is a God of, of wrath. He came as a lamb the first time. He comes back as a lion the next time. God is all powerful. Aren't you glad all that's fighting for you this morning? The power of God. To truly know God in his glory, we must approach him by spirit. It's not a scholastic thing to know God. You can't go to seminary and come away saying, oh, I know God. Believe me, Bubba and I sat in classes together with men who said they were called to preach. Woo, praise the Lord. I hope something's happened to them since. I don't mean that in an ugly way. Those men did not know God. You can't sit in a classroom and know God. It's not scholastic. It's not historical. You can't go back and read the scrolls and read history and go, well, this really happened. There's enough, there's enough evidence here that I believe the historical facts of the crucifixion and resurrection. I guess that's a great historical thing. Yes, it's historically true, but that's not how you know God. It's not experiential. Don't tell me you went to a crusade one time and got goosebumps and now you know God. God does not come by goosebumps. Preach, I wept for four hours. That's great, but God doesn't come through tears. He may bring you to tears, but he doesn't come through tears. God may stir your emotions, but emotions are not knowing God. 
So it's not scholastic. It's not historical. It's not exper experiential. God is a person to be known personally. Lastly, the power of knowing him. Notice back in 17.3. <clears throat> and this is eternal life. Why is it important to know God? To know God means that we have believed the testimony of who He is. And when we do that, that's the power of salvation. John 3, 3, uh, 3 33-36 He who has received His testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given, un, given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Why is it important that we teach your kids to know God. Why is it important this morning that you know who God is? That you know Him? Because knowing Him is to be changed by Him. Amen. Knowing Him is to be saved by Him. So I want to close by asking a few questions this morning. Do you know God? Or do you know about God? There's a vast difference, church. There's a vast difference. Do you know Him or simply know about Him? Has His life, love, and power made a difference in you? You see, knowing historical data will never change you. But knowing the one that changed history will change you. If you do know him this morning, are you satisfied where you are in your knowledge of him? You see, the scripture invites us and encourages us to grow in wisdom and knowledge. you're in that relationship are you just at the starter level desiring only the milk of the word or do you want the meat of the word that you might know him more and more and more do you know him or do you know about him this morning only you can answer that question but if you know him this morning I want to invite you to do something Let's pray together that our children might come to know him this week. Amen? Amen? There's a difference, church, between knowing about him and knowing him. The invitation is before you. Will you know him today? Bow with me as we pray. Father, thank you for the invitation that Jesus prayed for us, Lord, that we may know you Lord it boggles my mind that you even entertain one thought about me and my life but Father it's the same for each person here when you sent Jesus to the cross I was on your mind Father when he lived a perfect life I was on his mind Father, when he hung on the cross, I was on his mind. When he commended his spirit to you, I was on his mind. Father, when he took sin and deposited it in hell, I was on his mind. And Father, when he rose from the dead, I was on his mind. Father, every one of us have that same testimony this morning if we believe Christ. Lord, I pray that it matters today pray that it matters today that we know him. Lord, if there's some here today who simply have trusted knowing facts or knowing about him, Lord, I pray you'd invite him to come this morning to the real relationship. Father, 
Save some today by your spirit and by your power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you need to come this morning, don't, don't hesitate. You come. Please take your hymn books, hymn number 353. Let's stand together. 353, I know whom I have believed. 353 in your hymn books. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I am believing and am persuaded. tarry today or, or, or wait.